So I'm the CEO of a company called Plato, and we make a brain stimulator that I brought on stage. So I'll talk more about that towards the end of these 10 minutes. I want to say two things about my background because it's kind of skewed. I have a background with engineering, with medical equipment design. I've been working with things like airplanes and urine collection, so quite wide range of uh, medical products. But then I went on and did a PhD on psychology and how you can use psychology as a way to improve design processes. So at Plato we do three different things. First of all, we do some classical brain imaging, which is basically looking into people's head, trying to understand what is going on inside people's head when they're trying to be creative. Then secondly, we use that knowledge to try to build devices that can actually support that process to make people more creative using electricity. Then the last part we do that I won't speak too much about today is something we call crowd science, similar to crowdsourcing, but it's more based on the idea that the more people we have using a device, the more we can learn about how that device actually improves people's lives. So there are two ways of doing academic creativity research. And the first one is putting people into scanners, look at their brain, and then across a lot of different subjects, what we look for is what are the specific areas that people use when they are successful in being creative. So this is from a study we did with musicians who were improvising and what is open here is an area of the brain that they use that other people don't. So if I would ask you to improvise unless you're professional, then you won't use the specific area of the brain. So we're basically trying to map the brain, figuring out if you're an expert at some type of creativity, that's everything from art and music to mathematics and engineering, of course, what is specific about the expert brains that the rest of us don't have. The other thing that we do is we look at people in practice. So this is from another study we did where we looked at a lot of engineers from uh, Adobe making new software. And we tried to figure out exactly how do these experts work in their design process. So this is more externalizing the knowledge we have from the head and looking at how people use that in practice. So these are basically the two most important ways people are using their brains when they're trying to be creative. One is called divergent thinking. You might have heard about this before. Divergent thinking is the brain's ability to open up. It's the brain's ability to find new information. And that can be around us, but it can also be the knowledge we already have in our heads. The other ability that we also use is something called convergent thinking, which is basically the opposite. So you have a lot of ideas, you have a lot of material, and then you are sorting out and trying to figure out which part of all this information is actually the relevant one. So those are the two main ways people are using their brains when we look at how they work in practice with creativity. Then how are we trying to use this to help people to be more creative? It doesn't look like this at all, it's just a really, really nice picture. So what's going on in the brain on a very, very microscopic level is we have chain reactions of electrical signals and chemical processes. So while listening to me, Every single thought in your brain is the result of one of these reactions. And in human culture, we have about 10,000 years of experience with messing around with the chemical system. So if you guys are having a beer after on, then what you do is actually stimulating the chemical system. And because these are chain reactions by uh, mediating the chemicals, then that leads to a change in the electrical signals. And we've done that for a lot of years. Then what they've been doing for about 15 years is starting to mess around with the electrical signals instead. I'll come back to, to why that's a better idea than chemicals. And we use a technology called TDCS, and it's currently used in a lot of different places. I wanted to give four examples. It's used in training of uh, jet fighter pilots, where they've been scanning the brains of super expert pilots. And then they reproduce those electrical signals in the brain of people who are learning to fly. And by doing that, they can actually decrease the training time. So if you have the electrical signals of a super expert brain, then it takes you less time to learn how to fly. Then we're using the same technology for sniper training, where they use a type of stimuli that takes away all kind of noise in your brain. So one of the biggest problems for anyone who has tried to aim at something with a gun is your brain is doing all other type of things, so it's really hard to focus on exactly what you're supposed to do. And with this technology, they managed to take away the noise and could increase the efficiency of the shooters. 
They've also been using it in more medical domains, so they've been using it for treating depressions and they've been using it for uh, stroke rehabilitation. So those are some other uh, ways of doing it. So what we wanted to do was take all the brain scans that we have done, look into creativity, so all the knowledge we have about how the brain is working while being creative, plus all the other research that other researchers have done, and then we created a hypothesis about what does the optimal brain look like in terms of electrical signals when you are either opening up, so thinking divergently, and when you are closing down, thinking convergently. So we have these two different hypotheses on how should your brain look like when you're trying to be creative. Very simply explained, hopefully there are some engineers in here, electrical. So what you do is you create an electrical circuit where your brain is part of it. So you take a battery, two cables, to the plus and the minus, and then you attach them to two points in your head so that electricity runs in one place and is taken out of the other. So your brain is basically part of an electrical circuit. This is an old prototype, and you can see how simple it is here. So it's basically a 9 volt battery that is connected to a controller, so we could sort of adjust the electricity as we went on. Don't try this at home. So what happens then is where you put the current in, the brain gets a better potential for work. So it's not that you can force the brain to work, but the ability that part of the brain has to work gets better, and vice versa, where you take the electricity out, you have the opposite effect. So the brain has a harder time producing signals in that region. And on the smallest level that we work, so this is, it's not how it looks, but it's a picture of a synapsis, which is one of the smaller building blocks in the brain. What you can see here is in normal cognitive work, your brain sends an electrical signal, about six milliamps. That electrical signal is enough to cause a chemical reaction in the synapsis that leads on the electrical signal, so you get a, uh, the chain reaction continues. What we normally do is messing with the chemical reaction. What we're trying to do is mess with the electrical. So in using Plato, if the brain is not producing enough electrical signal, so in this example using only 4 milliamps, that's not enough to cause a natural reaction. So what we do is we add 2 more milliamps into that equation, which then sparks the natural chemical reactions and passes the signal on creating the effect that the brain was trying to do in the first place. This is a real good thing because we can't force the brain to do anything the brain wasn't trying to do in the first place. So it kind of limits the amount of unwanted effects that we can make. The product looks like this. I have a prototype with me. It has three electrodes, two in the front, one in the back. It has a very similar design as a regular helmet. Oh, we have the girl trying it. So there we go. So put it on, tie it in the back, and then you have three electrodes mounted to your head, small battery, and then you can steer it from your phone using an app, so you can choose which type of stimuli you want to run through your brain. In a typical use scenario, I think we all know the feeling, you sit down, you have a very challenging task, and you feel your brain is not there. You run into some type, some type of wall, and, and your brain is not doing what it's supposed to do. What you then do is, you put on Plato, you take the app, you pick whether you want to go into divergent or a convergent mode, and then for the following 30 minutes, the stimulator is helping your brain to achieve those kind of balances that we have seen that super experts are using in the similar type of tasks. The future of this technology, I think, is even more exciting. So in the back here, uh, one of my colleagues, Thomas, um, he's an expert in in-context EEG reading meaning that you can actually read what goes on in my brain right now. This becomes really exciting because what we can do then is if this device could also see what happened in my brain, I could choose the type of simulation that would be suited exactly to my prior type of activity. And in the coolest uh, extent, what you can use this technology for is basically copying, pasting mindsets. So if you wake up in the morning, you have a real good morning, one of those mornings, you put the device on, you record how does my brain look like when I have a great morning. And at a later point, if you have a shitty morning, you can put on the device and you can ask it to re-establish the balances that you had in that beautiful morning. So how is this better than drugs? So why not just use chemicals to achieve similar things? The big difference is how the two works in the brain. 
So the chemical system is adaptive, meaning that the more you take of a certain drug, the lazier the brain is to do the same process. That's why you normally have to increase the doses you take of a certain drug for it to work. But electricity is actually the other way around. So every time the brain makes an electrical operation, so it sends an electrical signal, it's easier for the brain to do that again. So it has a training effect. So every time we help the brain to do something, it's actually easier for the brain to redo the same thing at a later point in time. So the most successful use of these stimulators so far has, has actually been to train people to learn how to use the brain optimally. And that's, of course, the purpose of Plato, is that people will teach their brains to be perfectly creative exactly when I want them to be. So that was it. Thanks.